quickly becomes a calculus problem. It is not an addition or even a multiplication oh, problem. Yeah. And it, it really comes down to it is impossible to ever truly know your caloric expenditure for an hour, much less for a day or for weeks yeah. or months. It, it, you're, you're literally picking a number at random in the dark. And so, but insulin is something that's very concrete. We, and so uh, fat burning, that's what I'm all about, right? Is to help you burn fat. If you want to yeah. lose weight globally, if you want to lose bone density, if you want to lose muscle mass, then calorie restrict because you'll, you'll, you'll lose fat, but you'll also lose yeah. density and muscle and you'll lose cartilage and tendon and sinew. Yep. Starvation, fat. starvation is the wonderful way to waste away. Yes, but you're not going to just burn fat or lose fat. If you'd like to just lose fat and keep your muscle and keep your bone density, then you have to think about the hormone model of fat burning. And that's what Dr. Bickman's all about. I am unaware of any situation where a person can lose weight unless insulin is low. I am unfamiliar of any situation where a person can gain weight unless insulin is elevated. But actually just indicating that not only is insulin actually changing the, the, the actual biochemical handling of fat in the body and the fat cell, but it also changes metabolic rate. We, we published a, a study in 2018, which, which even then was supporting studies from 20 years ago and even 100 years ago. We have known that if you give a type 1 diabetic who is initially insulin deficient, you give them insulin, their metabolic rate will slow by about 300 calories per day. We are just finishing um, the, the work to publish our paper, finding that ketones, which, which I, I don't mean to introduce yet if we don't want to, in contrast, are stimulating metabolic rate. And both of this, insulin and ketones, are having an effect directly at the fat cell, stimulating the fat cell to be more or less active. Ketones, simple organic compounds made in the mitochondria of the liver. These provide an alternative energy source for your body when carbs are low. We've established over the last, uh, since about, what, the 1960s, that the calorie in, calorie out model, eat less, move more, that doesn't work. But that has went hand in hand with our obesity epidemic. So I define insulin resistance as, as two things. One, insulin isn't working the same way as normal in the various cells of the body, and that is a particular part of, of the disease state. In some cells, insulin is working the same as ever. In some cells, it is not. And, and that, again, the combination of that ends up being particularly problematic in light of the fact that the second aspect of insulin resistance is, as you state very accurately, the hyperinsulinemia. You cannot pull those two apart. Insulin resistance is hyperinsulinemia. And that is so profound in its simplicity because it changes how we detect diseases or diagnose them, and it changes how we treat them. We look at type 2 diabetes as a glucose disease, but in so doing, we detect it far later and we treat it far worse. If we look at type 2 diabetes as an insulin problem, well then, over the years, the insulin's been climbing, 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 the hyperinsulinemia of insulin resistance, but it's enough to keep the glucose in check. But this right here is so important because so commonly we say that uh, type 2 diabetes, your beta cells aren't making enough insulin. The glucose starts to climb and then we detect the problem. But the truth of the matter is in type 2 diabetics, they still have far more insulin than the average person. It is just not enough, so-called, to keep the glucose in check. It's because the pancreas simply can't make enough. And so in that situation of the steadily climbing glucose and insulin, the average clinician will say, well, we don't care about your insulin, so we're just going to bump it up even higher, uh, give you insulin injections because we know it'll push down your glucose. Yeah, it'll push down the glucose, but it'll make the person fatter and sicker than they were before. So much um, of the focus uh, on aging these days is to control a protein in the cells called mTOR. Yes. And that has led um, many to say, oh, well, dietary protein increases mTOR so that if you want to keep mTOR down and age really well, then eat less protein. And, and the, the actual human evidence throws uh, cold water on that idea because we see that uh, the people as they age that eat the least amount of protein have the higher mortality. So that doesn't hold up. But even still, that idea of you want to um, keep mTOR less activated and then you're going to age well, then all the more reason to control insulin because insulin stimulates mTOR far more 
than amino acids do from the dietary protein. So aging mm -hmm. is related to, to insulin potentially. Cancers, we know that breast and prostate cancers are incredibly responsive to insulin. Indeed, if you pull a biopsy of a normal breast tissue and compare it to a biopsy from a breast tumor, the breast tumor has seven times more insulin receptors in it than, than the normal breast tissue. That means it is seven times more responsive to that insulin. And what does insulin do? It tells cells to grow. You don't want a cancer cell to be told to grow. And of course, it, it's stimulating that growth. And, and then we could, we could I, I could, I'll just mention another one just because it might be unexpected. Even um, fertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, something I know you're familiar with. Um, in your practice, because it's so common, indeed, the most common form of infertility in women, it at its core is a disease of too much insulin, where the insulin is inhibiting the conversion of sex hormones in the ovaries. So this woman's ovaries end up overproducing androgens like testosterone that should have been converted into estrogens. That's just a basic truth of physiology that all estrogens were once androgens. So they come from testosterone, that's how it's supposed to be. But that conversion isn't happening. So her ovaries are pumping out a lot of testosterone when they should be pumping out a lot of the estrogen. Well, I love that you mentioned hypertension. I'll just say um, it's one thing to be eating salt. The kidneys are designed to deal with that salt. Um, and insulin doesn't let it do it properly. And insulin's forcing the kidneys to hold on to that salt, which is holding on to water and blood pressure just stays high. But it's also why people have such significant drops in blood pressure so quickly when they adopt dietary changes. If they look at their hypertension through the lens of insulin, then they just intuitively would say, or logically, how can I lower my insulin? All right, of the foods I eat, of the three macronutrients, of course, carbs spike insulin the most, I'm just gonna start eating less, boom. Blood pressure plummets just right lockstep with insulin coming down as well. Early in my practice, when I was starting to recommend the ketogenic way of eating to my most morbidly obese, most metabolically ill patients, they would come back anywhere from two weeks to a month later and say, Doc, I don't think this diet is right for me. Every time I stand up, I get lightheaded. That means that we can now stop one of your blood yeah, pressure yeah. medications. But so many people so often they become wedded to their medications. Like this is, it's a part of them, right? Like I have to have my pills. And, and when I say, no, that's good. That means it's time to stop one or two of your blood pressure medications. You should see the, the their face light up. It's the most beautiful thing. They're like, Oh, I didn't think of it like that. It's I just love that so much.